Dearest Texas history scholars, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Today we're going to look at Unit 8, Cotton Cattle Railroads and the Closing of the Texas Frontier. This chapter stretches from 1866 from 1900. The first thing that we're going to look at is the reasons for Western expansion. Now, historically, people have come to Texas because there is a lot of land. That has always been the case. That is ongoing. We're a very large state. There was also large supplies of longhorns. So people brought cattle with them as they moved to Texas, but then also even in the Mission Presidio system, they had cattle outside of missions. So those two factors combined leads to a lot of like interbreeding between like types of cattle, which produces Texas longhorns. And then after the Civil War, that creates a demand for beef in the northern and eastern states. So then the large supply of longhorns on the frontier are, a lot of them are like rounded up and then taken to um, railroads where they're ultimately sent to packing houses in northern cities. So they're worth $40 each. So if you have a herd of like 2,000 cattle, that's quite a bit of money. And I'm not good at math, but I know that's a lot of money. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna look at is the frontier wars. After the Civil War ended, the United States focused on forcing Native Americans onto reservations. These reservations were located in Oklahoma. and New Mexico. And then the conflict of like forcing Native Americans onto reservations is called the Frontier Wars. And this was a time of conflict between various Native American groups and the U.S. Army. The Native American groups are Comanche, Apaches, Kiowas, and then they are all opposing the U.S. Army. The U.S. Army creates a bunch of forts around Texas, um, Lake Fort Phantom is one of those, and Fort Griffin and Fort Concho, all of those were created during the frontier wars after the Civil War. Former enslaved African Americans fought Native Americans in Texas during the frontier wars. Native Americans gave African American soldiers the nickname Buffalo Soldiers for their bravery. Buffalo Soldiers, there you go. Uh, the last great chief is Kawana Parker. He was a skilled warrior. He, he lived here in West Texas around Abilene, especially around Weatherford. Weatherford is in Parker County, which is named after Quanta Parker. His mother was Cynthia Ann Parker. We can pause the video and talk about Cynthia Ann Parker. She's very, very um, interesting to study. But uh, Cynthia Ann Parker, and then that's his mother. His father was Chief Peta Nakona, and his mother was captured by Comanches as a small child and raised by them. He eventually, he meaning Quanta Parker, surrendered. He surrendered after evading, that means like trying to escape, evading the U.S. Calvary. He eventually assimilates, which means like adjusts, he adapts to, he adopts a new way of life. So he assimilates to American culture and influenced other Native Americans to do the same. Okie doke. Uh, let's talk about the cattle industry. The cattle, indus 
cattle were brought to Texas and Mexico during the Mission Presidio tax, uh, system, which began in the 1600s. That was way before the Civil War. Prior to the Civil War, Longhorn cattle roamed freely and mixed with other cattle. Increasing numbers of cattle migrated to western Texas and populated the region from the Rio Grande to the upper panhandle. That would be like the Great Plains and the North Central Plains. Following the end of the Civil War, the price of cattle increased. significantly and this attracted ranchers to the business resulting in a cattle boom long cattle drives from Texas to Kansas Colorado and Missouri resulted in cattle trails such as the Chisholm Trail the Chisholm, Chisholm Trail, and then also the Goodnight Loving Trail. Those are last names of ranchers, all three of those. All of those are notorious Texas ranchers. The Goodnight Loving Trail in an effort to move cattle to markets. So they're actually headed to railroads, and then the railroads take them to the slaughterhouses and in that process they're sold and the cowboys that take the cattle on the trail are paid $40 per cattle head. Ranchers consolidated land and then they started these things called land and cattle companies. We have some restaurants named after land and cattle companies in, in Abilene, Texas. Um, companies emerged, they controlled the industry, and that includes the something called the J.A. Ranch that's owned by Charles Goodnight and the XIT Ranch. We saw a picture of that in our introduction. Both locations were in the Panhandle, and then the King Ranch is still around. It's larger than Rhode Island. It's in South Texas. Ranchers in South Texas collaborated with vaqueros to operate the ranches and there was a kinship that developed that just means like a friendship between vaqueros and ranch owners panhandle ranchers hired cowboys and the employer employee relationship developed between the 1880s the cattle boom boom waned that means that it went like this it went down um that's when the long drives became less cost effective expenses on the trail had increased and the cattle sold for less after they lost weight on the trail. Kansas enacted laws forbidding Texas cattle from entering the state in the summer or fall, and the range could no longer support the amount of cattle being taken to market. The introduction of barbed wire brought a final end to cattle drives. A devastating winter in 1886 to 1887 caused the death of many can cattle and that was the final blow to the cattle boom. By the turn of the century, ranching had shifted to raising livestock in fenced pastures. So we kind of talked about this in our introduction, but we had this thing that was like wire and then it would have posts like this. 
And then they would twist little pieces of wire and it would kind of look like this. And that would create a barbed wire fence which could keep animals in or out. And so when it says fenced pastures, it just means that they're using this newer technology at that time, barbed wire to keep animals inside of a pasture. And then they're not losing weight wherever that is, losing weight on the long walk. And in addition, there's like growth of railroads so that there's more rail stops. They don't have to walk all the way to Kansas. Then we have a windmill. That's also another piece of technology. The windmill facilitated raising cattle in areas without ready access to bodies of water and growing winter feed for livestock. So instead of everybody living in the coastal plains where all the rivers are, they can use windmills to move into West Texas. Cowboy way of life. The tradition and dress of Spanish vaqueros were adapted by American cowboys. Cowboys came from diverse backgrounds, including African-American, Native Americans, Mexicans, and settlers from, Eastern, from the Eastern United States. Many were former Civil War soldiers and former enslaved people. And then some were women. Cowboys worked long hours caring for cattle and horses, repairing fences and buildings and conducting long cattle drives. Many lived in shared living quarters called bunk, called a bunkhouse. That makes me think of Kiki Waka. Maybe it was like that, I don't know. And they worked in groups. The work of the cowboy involved using a lasso. That's like a rope, more than a gun. Cowboys faced many hazards, especially the, the threat of stampedes. As well as enduring extreme weather conditions. Here's a list of some of the famous cowboys that we had. Um, let's talk about the growth of the railroads. Growth of railroads. Effects on the growth of railroads. This allowed raw material in Texas to be sent to northern markets. And then Texans had fast, inexpensive, and reliable transportation. So this is transporting people and goods, which completely changes the culture of Texas. This was also a cause for industrialization in Texas. That means the use of machines like in factories or bigger companies or um, using more technology and iron and metal to create things. Contributions of James Hogg as Texas Attorney General and Governor, James Hogg worked to reform big business and fought to protect citizens from unjust business practices. Hogg also supported the creation of the Texas Railroad Commission. Oh, spelled road wrong. Only I could misspell roads. Texas Railroad Commission. Um, this pr helped protect citizens from unfair prices set by railroads. That's how it started. And then it still exists and they just protect consumers from unfair prices in bigger businesses. It's still a thing. We're going to look at farming and ranching industry growth as a result of the closing of the frontier. And the first thing that we're gonna look at is the political impact. 
when we talk about political patterns over time, we draw a little government building. Ooh, last page of notes, here we go. The Range Wars were a conflict between ranchers and farmers. They cut and destroyed fences. They burned pasture land, resulting in gunfire and lower property values. A legislation, which means a new law, focused on fence cutting becoming a felony. That means like a big time crime. This increases the revenue for the state. The economic impact, we want to draw dollar signs for that. Uh, products were moved, sold, and transported across the nation by a railroad system. We have a new cash crop during this time. The new ca cash crop was grown in Texas. Cotton and sorghum. Cotton and corn were grown across the state because of irrigation technology. Expansion of the railroads. Cattle ranching becomes a bigger business rather than a way of life. And then there is a growth of ranches. There's a lot of income from agriculture. that exceeds the income from cattle ranching in the 1900s. The next thing that we're gonna look at is the social impact that has to do with people. How do all these changes affect people? There is a growth of population in West Texas. Places like Abilene, places like Midland and Odessa, Amarillo, Lubbock, all of those are West Texas towns that popped up during this time. There is a use of barbed wire to fence off land so now people can mark where their property is. New methods of farming include dry farming, irrigation, and terraces. There is an increase in sharecropping and tenant farming and this results in many people going into deep debt. Tenant farming Tenant farming are is like farmers who rent land to grow crops on and sharecropping Sharecropping is farmers who rent the land, the tools, the seeds, the houses, and then they are promised a part of the crop that they help grow as a payment. Like they're paying, they grow all these crops and then they're paying the landowner. Um, so that's how sharecropping works. It's not fair at all. It results in deep debt. This is these are negative things that happen in society after the Civil War. Technological advancements. The first one is irrigation. Irrigation. Uh, when windmills were invented, farmers and ranchers were able to water their crops and animals on their own property without having access to a river or an aquifer. An aquifer is like an underground water source. Transportation. Due to the growth of the railroad in Texas, I'm not going to spell road wrong. <gasps> Yay, I did it right. Oh, and I knocked over the key. Okay, due to the growth of the railroad in Texas, people were able to travel, live, create new businesses in all areas of Texas, including South and West Texas, that means like South and West Texas. Um, and they were able to transport crops and cattle across Texas and the United States. So people in Texas make more money because of the railroads. They're able to sell goods, buy goods. They're able to travel more. It just brings a lot of like very good 
things in Texas. It also creates jobs, so that's important. Um, and then, of course, we have barbed wire, which is a new technology. We've been talking about that. Barbed wire allows farmers and ranchers to close off land and mark private property. This physically closes off parts of the open range. And those are your notes. Have a wonderful day.